Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and have you ever seen an organization deliver feature after feature after feature in their software with seamlessly no issues? I have, and you do that with mature software delivery, which is exactly what we cover today. Joining me today is Elias Nogueira, and it was a real blast learning from his way of working, what quality is in software, as well as how to collaborate with product. Enjoy! I was going to say, I just joined recently a new client and the person there, the product manager, and he also did most of the Scrum Master rituals, his preference was really having a physical board. So then when kind of a sprint cycle changed, <clears throat> then everyone would be in the office. And I agree with that. I think that has my preference as well. And there was one problem still, because we had people that would either join remotely and then a physical board doesn't work. Mm. As soon as it hit hybrid, there were pain points because then it's like, yeah. oh, what do you want me to put on the physical board? <laughs> like it didn't work anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So that I thought that was funny. Yeah. When I was working the, uh, in the previous company before I moved here, mm. uh, we had a lot of teams like uh, initially doing Scrum and for them to learn in the process and like visualize it, that yeah. was was like really uh, the uh, bad uh, best decision doing this like in a formal way, like with its stickers, yeah, and everything. So they can like, okay, they, they can understand the flow. Mm. They are actually doing something. I don't know if like probably you learn a little bit faster, like by doing things instead of just like creating some abstraction. Yeah, And uh, it was really easy because after a while they like, okay, they, they were mastered. It's not that difficult, but yeah, it's good because as well, like it's not just like that stand up meeting that you just talk, yeah. but you talk and do something. And you talk about, you get a sticker note and talk about the sticker note. This is the thing. Yeah, this is what we are doing. Yeah. And it's it's different. It's just different. Then you are in online with a board, like, okay, talking about the tasks. It's completely different. Yeah. But it's it's the, yeah, it's the nowadays. Uh, yeah, we have to-ish. <laughs> yeah. I, I almost forgot about that. Like when I, when I first learned about Scrum and that way of working, I love the physical board. It made so much sense to me. And we could do that because everyone was in the same room. Yeah. Now with that history, I can do it digitally and I, I, we know kind of that routine and that way of working. But yeah, people coming into it and then just staring at a digital board, I think that is uh, kind of the loss of magic. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's different like because we are seated all the time. So, okay, let me check the board. It's just a different tab. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. physically you, you stand up, you go there, you think, okay, you, you think more, you, yeah. you ask someone to join and okay, what do you think about this, this and that? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you don't have to ask a person to move it. You can actually go and you move the thing yourself. You're like, I'll do yeah, it. Yeah. People move it's their done. stuff. Yeah. 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 I love that. Are you there to, or have you facilitated those sessions as well when it comes to either a planning or a retro? Or yes. A, yeah. yeah. Do you like facilitating? I like facilitating. Yeah. In the way, like for me, uh, I, I work at, at some point with an, uh, like with a jail coach, yeah. but more for technically in this in this way not for all the, the the framework and formalities but more okay let's try to combine that is for me is the real agile mm. let's combine what the frameworks do yeah. does with the technical part how we can tech, technically now can do those things in a agile way mm. with some technical practice yeah and uh one of the things i was doing i, I was the only one during the planning session I was like, guys we will have one day planning session mm. The time slot will be w the whole day. Okay. And we will just stop when we have everything. If you don't have everything, the next day we will plan again. Mm. Why is that? Because for me, time boxed uh, uh, plannings are not that good. Mm. We can have refinement sessions, etc. But if you have everyone thinking about all the possibilities together, like without interruptions, it's better and it's faster, mm. actually. Then you break it down in like different refinements, then a planning session, then you start. So after a while, in the beginning, wasn't like like wasn't good <laughs> enough because yeah, the whole day was starting and some we were distracting a lot. But after a while, most of the people understand this. Yeah, and they can like of course like taking two three hours and it's done. I like that. They a lot. have everything. They talk about all the problems, possible problems, edge cases, and ever so everything basically. Yeah, and it's good. Just to to play devil's advocate, did you see that people would get drained? Doing that kind of one day. Sure. After 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 three four hours max, they are Jesus Christ. Yeah. Man, let's right? do any other thing. Yeah. 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 But they would stick with it and they would reap the benefits. Yeah. 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 Few teams did it with me actually, but the teams that stick with it, like they they, they really saw the benefit. I like that a lot. I might try that out. What we have now is I, I'm coming into a role and I'm I'm taking up that facilitation mantle, 
And I like the idea of looking at what's there first and then being like, okay, how can we change this and how can we prove this and how can we try things out like a dedicated day and we go until we're finished? Because from a focus perspective, I like that. Otherwise, you're going to switch and you're going to start working and then you have to get back into refinement mode and what did we discuss again? And that's all going to take extra time. So I really like that dedicated focus approach. But do you have this as well as a a facilitator? Mm. Sometimes you see some problems. The guys are not seeing the problem. You're seeing the problem. At some point, you need to tell them, guys, this is a problem no one is seeing. Is that true or not? So they, oh, yeah, we we forgot about it. Yeah, we forgot about it. Sometimes I do this. Not sometimes a lot. I do this a lot. Yeah? Yeah, when I do, when I'm facilitating, like I try more doing facilitation than more like mentoring Mm. because it's, it's different. It's a different approach. Okay. Yeah. You get more people involved instead of like coaching and mentoring individually. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in initiatives that I'm running, uh, I'm trying to be the, uh, the facilitator all the time instead of like telling the guys, guys, this is the direction. This is what we need to do, etc. What is your opinion? So instead of me seeing what they are opinion first, mm-hmm. I was giving the, all the possible cases. It's good. Let's say it, it really depends, right? Mm. Uh, it really depends on the seniority of people you have, the team you have, but uh, uh, what I'm learning nowadays. Yeah. Uh, to hear more from them, and then I can give them, okay, this is a missing piece you guys are forgetting, etc. Yeah. So, But for me, it's still difficult. So I still want as a facilitator to, to give them the answers, you know? Of course, you have to hold yourself back. Yeah. I, I One of the reasons I really like facilitating is because I get the best This is what I think. I get kind of the best experience understanding everything. If I'm not facilitating, I feel like I just do my part of the work and I I explain that and I understand what others are doing, but not into the detail of when I'm facilitating that type of stuff. doesn't matter whether it's a retrospective. I feel like in a retro, I really get a sense of the team as a whole Mm -hmm. Um, or it's a planning or it's a stand-up even. I get better insights. That's why I like facilitating. And because of that, I don't want to hoard that just with me. So then I think maybe other people want to do it. If they don't, then I'll gladly take it. Yeah. But it does come with maturity. And then even so, I feel like not everyone likes facilitating. Like even the most senior engineers, they don't really mind if someone else facilitates. Like it doesn't, it's not a thing that goes hand in hand necessarily. It can, but it doesn't have to. And uh, there's a funny thing. I I believe like some companies are, uh, have this approach to, they have the team Mm. and, any different way of facilitating for everything, they are rotating. And this is one of the uh, worst o- options ever mm, because really? you maybe will force someone that doesn't doesn't want to do that yeah. or not that good and wants to focus in another thing. Yeah. So if you get the people that, okay, I in the team I can see one or two that likes facilitating, let's stick to it. Instead of like having everyone yeah. uh, 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 create these opportunities for everyone. Sometimes they don't want to focus on that and focus on other things. So yeah, yeah it's like, tricky, right? It could be the, maybe the people that have had that, it's either the fair approach, so everyone does it, so it's fair for everyone, or then no one wants to do it, so then we make it all equal, so then it's equal mm. participation. It's like one of those. But I, I, I agree with you. If one person really likes doing it, I like doing it, then yeah, let that person do it. Yeah. People will be happier doing what they e- love. E- exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to cover mainly kind of mature software delivery with you, and I think we already sliced open way of working. I think... Everyone has kind of their own way of working, things that they've seen in the past and things that they're going to bring with them in the future in ways of working. But especially when you come together as a new team or an existing team, if you don't have a way of working yet, there's going to be opinions conflicting. When you say, we want, I want a dedicated day because I've seen that work best. <clears throat> and other people are like, no, that's going to drain me. I want fragmented things and stuff like that. From your experience, how do you usually consolidate into like a team way of working that is really effective for that team? Uh, what I think... Uh uh, my context now they have I have fourteen teams, mm. so for me like uh, I need to have a bare minimum process set for yeah, all the teams. So I need the same way of working for some aspects, let's say in the, the in the development process, equally like distributed equally and done in the same way. Yeah. So I know like I can predict if they have an issue. Uh, uh, the main benefit that I'm, te- I'm telling them is the uh, how I can say this is the they can. Uh, help each one Mm. in different things, like a hundred people can help each one. Because when you have a problem, everyone is doing the same thing in that way. So they can help each each other uh, more faster, faster actually, than if they are doing a different way. 
So the guys needs to stop, analyze, and we spend a, a little bit more time. Okay. But you you could you could say to me that okay, this will, would break like somehow the innovation or bring up like uh, uh, bring to the process new uh, new process, new approaches, new aspects. Uh, but for me, bare minimum process established. Mm. Then you open up for teams to do this differently. Okay. And of course, you need to give them time to do this differently, even though it's that that process is working mm. and one team thinks, okay, this process might be done differently. I would say, okay, do this in your team first, do a POC, runs it, and then share the experience. Other people, other engineers will, uh, will evaluate, will ask questions, etc. And if you see that it's beneficial, instead of rolling out to everyone, Let's adopt to more, more two, three, four teams. Yeah, gradually. And then, yeah, we roll out to, to everyone. But I believe like uh, being open mm. and have this opportunity to have this freedom to change things is is the main is the main is the main aspect. Yeah, of course, because otherwise we would work like for years doing the same boring stuff. Let's say in this sense, <laughs> right? And uh, there there will be no innovation because you are doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, but like the set of Bare minimum process for me is good, yeah. But open to everyone to try out anything they they want. I really like that. I I had a problem in one of the teams mm. that we are we were doing this. One team wasn't doing like this. Okay, not and, even uh, the bare minimum. Not even the bare minimum because yeah. the main engineer in that team was saying, "Okay, I have better ways to do it." Mm. Oh, of course we know, and that engineer was really smart. And okay, first, wh why why would you like uh, try? We were saying like try first, mm. doing what the, all the teams are doing. Yeah. Then you apply what you're suggesting in your team, so you can prove like in this way you can prove that's working. It's there's a lot of benefits, but I, no, no, I will do my way. My way mm. is the same. Yeah. O okay. The end goal will be the same. We will we will deliver software in the same way, mm. but uh, in the end, he were doing like uh, in a super over engineered way. Mm. Okay. That he had the same results sometimes even faster, but the cost for that was higher in terms of development. Yeah. So that's that. That's why I'm thinking it's like proving to the other teams actually nowadays that, okay, it's not good if you try to do everything alone. Mm. And if you if you don't follow the, bar, uh, the bare minimum process, you need to follow bare minimum process first and then you bring bring like to the table and new things. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I love that approach, especially from you overseeing those teams and then helping when it's necessary. Even teams co-creating and collaborating and helping each other when it's necessary. As long as we have the same bare minimum, then you know the processes that are in place yeah. and you can adapt to anything that is new that's built on top of that. Yeah. Could you give like an overview of the bare minimum you're talking about? Uh, in terms of what we do nowadays in the end-to-end -end process, yeah. uh, in a super short way, we do have like, we start with developing an API with like the uh, uh, services with unit testing, integration tests. In the integration test part, uh, we divide in two different areas. Mm. The integration between, the integration between uh, the service and the mocks. And we have the database part as well. Yeah. So instead of doing this, any database upgrade, migration, etc., we do have this integration layer because we have all the scripts, everything, we know everything that will be changing in advance. So we do this in the integration layer as well. Mm. So we, when we run the full set before we merge anything, we run the integration tests for all the supported database, for yeah. all the tests we do have in parallel, so to minimize the, 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 the time. And then we run all those database migrations, upgrades, et cetera, just make, when we have one, of course, just to prove, okay, everything is fine. Mm. So we can go to the next step. Next step for us, uh, we have somehow the, we call it capability testing, but it's mm. the end-to-end -end API test. Mm -hmm. So we deploy an environment, an ephemeral environment, and then we run the same, uh, not the same set of tests, but the tests without the mocks, but with the real integration. Yeah. We exclude the mocks, we put a real service there communicating with each other, then we test that part. Yeah. And uh, basically we are doing all the front-end scenarios that the user would do, we are doing through the APIs. Perfect. Because nowadays, like everyone, like a front-end web or mobile consumes those, those APIs. If I guarantee that I'm testing this through the API layer and there is no issue, yeah. probably there will be no issue in the front-end when the user, like as a user, I will, I would use that. Yeah. And that then we have the set of tests in the front-end, mm. but in the front-end is same as the back-end, unit integration, then this part without mocks, 
which we have the environment with the front end and we can test things. Yeah. But the number of tests we have in this last part in the end to end is far way less than the, the API layer. Exactly. Because we try to balance those things. Yeah. And we know that we spend a lot of time in the front end because it's flaky. Uh, it's, it's difficult to spin up an environment, not difficult to spin up an environment with the front end, but it's more time consuming mm. because you need the front end, you need to interact with the front end. It's not that fast than the API itself. Yeah. You need to do the flows. You need to wait for each page or each interaction. So it takes more time. Yeah, built and up. We, and yeah, and it. we need to be really smart on which type of test and kind of test we had there. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. It gives kind of a great overview of, of the quality and the baseline that is there. And then teams probably built on top of that based on new functionality that comes in. Yeah, and for example, like uh, before, this part with the database, mm -hmm. we had after the full end-to-end -end APIs. Mm. And uh, we were thinking, okay, but we have all the technology to do this beforehand, yeah. to do this integration layer. Yeah. So we started something, we call it like, the, we have the shift left testing approach, mm -hmm. that everything that we can shift left, like at the beginning of the process, not only technically like writing code, but anything, any practice, we start earlier instead yeah. of start later. Uh, and we start a technical uh, uh, approach on the shift left testing, like seeing, okay, what everything we can do to shift left. Mm -hmm. And we saw like two things. One was this database migration and upgrading everything. And another, like in this end-to-end -end API test, we were doing a single calls to the API instead of testing integration. So, okay, this doesn't belong here. This mm -hmm. should be before. Yeah. So we started this and actually we could reduce a lot the whole uh, uh, full cycle of testing because yeah, we are doing tests like faster yeah. and all the time. So we can get the issues first uh, in advance. And then we focus on what we use, uh, let's say the customer's focus perspective or customer uh, tests or anything like this. Like, okay, I will think act like a customer mm -hmm. and I will apply those tests in an end-to-end way. Yeah, the actual user journeys. User that journeys, way. yeah. Yeah, perfect. Has has there ever been a way, uh, or not really a way, a scenario where people would cut corners basically in that testing suite? Because as new functionality comes in, and especially with pressure from the business to deliver, people might think that delivering the software without tests or without accommodating for integration or users user journeys is faster. But obviously, you and I know that for the long term, it's it's actually quite harmful. Uh, I'm blessed that the, in this current company, the, the product people knows the benefits of doing this first. Yeah. So they really knows. And uh, actually they ask when, when they are running these sprints and uh, everything that the quality engineer does, like it's, we have quality engineers, backend and frontenders. Mm. So, uh, and they work in a, distribu they distribute the load. Yeah. So during the planning sessions, they talk, okay, those acceptance criteria, uh, this one, will be done in the front end, in the uh, back end integration layer only. Mm. There will be no end-to-end uh, -end tests for that. Okay. But this, this, and that, we will have end-to-end uh, -end tests. And uh, they start development at the same time. Mm. So quality engineers start at the same time as the development. So yeah. even there is no, like, let's say, they start one day behind, mm. basically, right? Because like when they start, okay, there is nothing to do in the quality part. But as soon as they have some code, they start together with the backend developers or frontend developers doing this. Yeah, and uh, we start in full automate uh, uh, in the full automation like mode in this mm. way. We almost don't do manual tests. Okay, only few verifications in the front end, yeah. and we focus more on testimation because we know the, all the benefits. And actually, the product managers, product owners, they during this sprint they check, okay, are you doing the automation for this feature? Because they know that like you do one time and then you have the benefit later. Yeah, then they don't have to do it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And yeah. this was a problem as well. Ah. Because everything basically is, uh, uh, is automated and they were not doing like the, we call it PO check. Mm. This is good because they were trusting the team, that yeah. the team's doing this and testing, everyone is uh, testing this. But at some point it's good to have the, the owner of the product, like taking a look at the product in, before we can deliver, yeah. instead of after. Yeah. Because it was happening after. After we, del uh, we was delivering the process, the, 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 pro the project itself, the product owner, a few days later, uh, okay guys, but this, like, this should be changed, that should be changed, but okay, we just delivered that. Yeah. You are in another iteration, so why you are like, the too late? It's too late. Yeah, what happened? And we have, and we have this, of course, discussions <laughs> with the PO. So now, nowadays they, they can see this benefit, of course. They need to see during the development process how the software is being built. Mm -hmm. And I believe this is a 
it's my personal opinion. It's kind of a, a general a problem mm. because some some POs, I believe, are not that involved during the development cycle. They okay. wants to they wants to see the final product like a stakeholder. Yeah, yeah, not during the development cycle. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting, right? Because if you're creating the tests, let's say on an end to end perspective or a, on a user flow perspective, your assumptions or how you think the world works is going to also be in there. And if the PO trusts that what they think is right, everyone thinks is right, yeah. then then you have no issues. But that's like that's really hard to achieve. Like that's almost impossible. That's why you always need kind of that that second pair of eyes, that sanity check to go over it. And especially from the PO role, that is just the responsibility that lies there. We, so then to do it as a stakeholder instead of kind of during that if you don't do it during, you don't get the ability to steer left or right. And then you do it after, like any other exactly, stakeholder. Yeah. And sometimes they are like, uh, at least in our process, they are creating this idealization first with the designers, mm. and then can they can see the software, but they cannot touch. They can yeah. see all the designs, everything, and all they the are markups. imagining, okay, yeah, all the mockups, okay, this might work mm. because it's uh, they they create this idealization of the project of the feature. Of course, they know everything, but it's different when you start using it. Yeah, yeah. So, so all, the get all the benefits you get when they start using it, they, and they started ha having a second thought. Okay, mm, this is not that good as, as I was imagining using yeah. the mockup, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The pain points arise when you actually fiddle around with the tool. And stuff pops up. It will always pop up in development after, like it's, I think it's inherent. And as long as you take kind of this iterative approach that whatever we have can still adapt in the future, I think it's better. Th there are two things that I also, always say is that uh, there are two things that will never change. Mm. PO will change something mm. later, and when they are experimenting, of course, because they they can change their mind as well, of course. Yeah. This is one. And second, we will all the time deliver some issues. Mm. It's it's impossible to deliver no issues. We aim to it, but we deliver. Yeah. So if we start thinking about it and we start to, okay, being fine with that, the whole development process, the interactions with everyone will be easier. Yeah, you know? it gets easier. I, I've never, because I heard you mention that before, I've never worked with specifically the term quality engineers within my team. Have you, do you think that's a great way of working when you mentioned front and back end and then separate quality engineers? Yeah, uh, I, I've i been like uh, working this term, not working this term because that is the term in the market, mm -hmm. but what I'm truly believing, uh, at least I'm following my teams and I, I influence in my teams, that uh, you have a group of software engineers, yeah. back end, front end, and quality. So a quality engineer is also a software engineer. It's not like that we know from the past, like a tester that does do more manual testing than mm -hmm. another thing. No, it's a software engineer yeah. that knows software engineering, knows a little bit of programming backend and frontend, and nowadays like knows a little bit of DevOps. But his specialization is quality. Yeah, like a backend, backend, but the backender knows testing, knows DevOps, knows a little bit of something yeah the same for quality engineers the quality engineers for me is like the software engineers with quality specialization and uh from component company depends so the 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 where is the focus right so mm. in some companies more towards the front end in some companies more towards the back end yeah some companies are more devops in our case it's a mix of everything so yeah. because that's like we have this quality engineer to advise the, the the other engineers in the way of quality and where we should like if we need to add more tests, we are missing some edge cases, more techniques, we can do it faster. Mm. But also helping them to create those test automation. Yeah. Sometimes not creating itself because sometimes the backend developer needs to create all the integration tests, but we are trying, we are not trying, but we are looking at the, the tests and say, okay, guys, this test is the test that we have defined it, but it's not covering everything we should cover. Mm. So they can double check and they can like, uh, pass this, uh, do this mentoring part in quality to all the developers. Yeah. And for me, like this is the way that all the quality uh, 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 guys should do like nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, I really, I, I really think that everyone as an, should be an engineer in position. We are adding to the titles, right? DevOps engineer, yeah, yeah. backend engineer, so et cetera. Yeah. But we need this engineering part, the basic of engineering. And this is something missing a little bit in the quality area mm. because we have still this uh, quality people working more towards to the product as well sometimes. Yeah. 
and work more in the um, uh, working more in the front end part, mm. not in the back end or different aspects that are important for the for the uh, for the product. Yeah, the the ones I've seen more from history, and then I'm talking five plus years ago, would only test indeed like a regression test from a user perspective. So go through the all front the flows, end, click yeah. and click and drag basically, and then after each iteration, after each sprint delivery, do that again and then again, and then throughout the years, I've seen that evolve into automation. And then as you say, yeah, I, I do see that component of quality more so being prevalent more and more within engineering. The only part it was where my um, where I didn't really understand what a quality engineer does, but now that you explained it, it's still hand in hand, right? With a focus on quality, but engineering as a core. Yeah. And I think with that explanation, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there's a second thing like uh, we still, the market still thinks that the quality engineers or quality people mm. needs to be more in the product side. Okay. And I disagree. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I also disagree, I think, yeah. Uh, any engineer should know about the product. Absolutely. Not the quality engineer with the product owner. Everyone needs to understand equally the product so yeah. we can better develop that product. If we think like, no, let's try to create this separation. Quality engineers will do the front-end testing, like, yeah, manual automated, and we'll talk more to the people about the features and see all the edge cases. This is in the end of the process. Yeah. We should bring to the, like, we should push to the left, the shift left testing or shift left mentality. And then we, like, together with the PO, everyone should understand the product. And then we can build the product yeah. in a better way. Yeah, interesting. As kind of a thought experiment, have you seen let me take a step back. For me, when there's more roles and responsibilities, when people get a title like DevOps, front end, back end, they put themselves more so in this box. Yeah. And then when work pops up, work gets basically grabbed based on those boxes if it's front end or back end. But then what slips through is the work that's kind of in the middle. So especially when you have a new role like quality engineering, are, have you seen people say, oh, that's kind of their job and I don't do that? Or how do they still kind of cooperate and get stuff done because those titles, they sometimes do make a difference. Yeah, and the, the most common uh, behavior or bad behavior is that uh, when you have a quality, when you have a, a specialized engineers, yeah. right? Backend, frontend, and quality. Uh, and uh, if you don't have the good or uh, good mentality or quality mentality across the team, the backend there will see the word test, mm. it's quality engineer yeah, job. Yeah, just scooch it that front way. Frontend will say, okay, the, we need to test something in the front end. We have a quality engineer for that. Yeah. And they are just like not doing actually their job that they should do. Mm. And should be in cooperation. That's why we divide the work there. Yeah. Uh, those kind of things like integration, it's a core for each engineer. Like the back end engineer knows how to do integration, the front end knows. The quality engineer shouldn't be involved of creating it, but reviewing it mm. and talk to them and say, okay, are we covering all the possible cases? Let's talk together, let's see, because this is the shift left. Yeah, and then okay, what is more end to end or has more integration or any kind of test like performance tests or accessibility testing or any kind of like no functional test? We can give it to the quality engineers, yeah. and they can help the team to mm. uh, uh, deliver this because they have more like uh, <laughs> they have more knowledge on that. So exactly, it's, that's it's, their focus. It's, yeah, it's yeah, what makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. I think. Have you ever been in a situation because especially you mentioned quality engineers advise. But with the role of an advisor, can also people can also say, well, we take that advice, but we still do this. And that can have consequences. And then I think your culture is kind of make or break there. Because if it's a culture of blame, and I told you so, that's very harmful. No, yeah, it's, it's not a culture of blame. Yeah. Uh, uh, thankfully, all the teams uh, are super good, uh, cool in this way. That's good. Uh, but this happens sometimes. Yeah, right. Uh, but we most of the time we send like reminders. So... Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the team decided that we won't do this, this and that, or we would uh, add one or two edge cases. It's fine. Yeah. But normally we see the problems later. Mm. We see one like later, not in the next iteration, but like months later, and we are just setting a reminder, guys. We discussed about it, and we didn't do. Yeah. So let's try to next time. Let's try to implement. It will take like more 10 minutes, 15 minutes, doesn't matter, but we can prove that we take less time. Now we are discussing more than 10 minutes just because we didn't do this before. Yeah. And uh, and there's a second the second thing for me in the terms of, terms of teams, it's not fully related to quality, but it's also related to quality. It's giving them this opportunity to, okay, I don't want to do it, I don't see the benefit, okay, let's don't do it. Mm. And uh, if we fail, we fail. 
we learn with that failure, we see what we can improve, and then we improve later. Yeah. So this culture of like more culture of failure for me, it's really good. Not because you won't deliver anything, but like allow them to fail yeah. in interactions and try to see the problems. You know, we try to find a solution. It, it's the best. It's so they can learn important. really, really fast. Yeah, I feel I feel like I've I've heard that more and more, and I feel like sometimes it's hard to put in practice. But I think the more people have that mindset of failing is okay, and it's a it's a way to learn and progress. I think it's like at the heart of engineering culture because what we do does not come without fail. Fail is always there. It's yeah. always going to be there. Yeah. You also mentioned, oh, we're going to deliver software and it will have issues. So if we accept that it has issues, we can accommodate for that. And we're not surprised when it actually does have issues because it, it will happen. I feel like that's very important for a team to kind of mature and also in their delivery. Yeah. yeah. And even for people that never did something, we are saying, okay, do this. And they say, okay, maybe we fail. Maybe this will be a problem for other teams. Do. Mm. If it's a problem, first, acknowledge the problem. Second, ask for help. Yeah. Then a lot of different engineers will jump in to help you. And this is what happens, actually. That's great. Because we have this uh, kind of fear that, okay, uh, we did a mistake. We, we need to hide ourselves first, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. We need to talk to the team. Okay, I have this problem. Like, f please uh, help me to fix. But actually, uh, if we allow ourselves to say, okay, guys, hey, I did this mistake. It was me. I'm sorry. But I need, and I need help to yeah, fix yeah. because I don't know how to fix. A lot of engineers will say, okay, yeah, it's a normal thing. No right? problem. No problem. Let's yeah. jump in and let's fix it. Yeah. And uh, as soon as you allow this as well, and uh, it's a, it's a, it changes your, your minds a little bit, right? Because most most of the people don't want to show show and say, okay, it was me. Yeah, scary. Know? And uh, when we allow this, and people see, okay, I t I was sharing that it was me. No one blamed me. Nothing happened. And they, they are more comfortable doing these mistakes. And actually they will next time when they are doing, they have like a different opinion and maybe this will uh, fail. Mm. They are doing the same thing before. So they are going to the channels and say, guys, I will deliver this. I don't know if there's probably there's a problem and not seeing it, please help me. Yeah. The engineers will jump in the same way if they, if they had a the problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like that we covered and started with kind of way of working and then we dove more into the quality aspects of software. I think when we're talking about really mature software delivery, a big aspect is the collaboration between engineering and product and making sure that that is a smooth operation, that there's trust on both sides and that you can also deliver based on that with realistic expectations. I don't know where it sometimes goes wrong if the, if the product side is kind of lacking that engineering mindset or if the engineering side is kind of lacking that, let's say, functional requirement the bit in the business mindset and the value that they need to deliver. I feel like it's always going to be somewhere in between. But I think I shared with you before, from my side now, I'm, I'm moving from engineering to product just to kind of experience that. And it is fun having seen kind of both sides and the pain points there. What are the, some of the pain points you've seen in the past? Yeah, and, uh, and, and it's the both ways, right? Yeah. Because uh, we don't actually, the, 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 the main thing for me, it's that we don't know how to communicate between, between each other. Yeah, from because both sides. the Yeah, because the, 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 all the jargons and everything is different. So yeah. we need to learn this like a new language to communicate first, and then we can, not, the, uh, not only the, the way we, they talk about the product or we talk about tech, but also... Uh, understanding the keywords of the benefits. Mm. So for me, if you tell product people, okay, I have this, I cannot deliver this on time because this will impact X days in the process and or this, if I just take one more day to finalize all the things, yeah. this won't have this issue in the customer which will stop the customer, you preventing the customer using it, and maybe this will uh, uh, give them a loss of X millions or anything like this, they will get your, they will get your attention. They will, yeah. You have their attention. It's their language. If you, uh, yeah, when you start uh, like understanding their language, okay, customer, money, things like that, that actually product, right? Yeah. So, okay, they will stop and they listen to you. Mm. And they will help you actually. And uh, for me, the, the when I talk to product people, most of the time I talk about the problem. Of mm. course, they could, we have a problem. This yeah. is the problem. This is the context. I, I love like when I write a message to everyone, like a, it's like a chapter. Mm. Like I give the context. I give the what is happening. 
why that's happening, what are the possible solutions, what is the impact of that? And the most most important for product people, the impact. Yeah. And I say, guys, this is the impact risks, and uh, I cannot take this, this risk alone. Mm -hmm. So it needs to help me to understand. And for me, in the end, Product people have the decisions, of course, because it's product, and that's why uh, it's uh, there's a steering wheel for the company. So they know the direction, they know what the customer wants, etc. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the main, the, the other problems we do have, it's uh, this kind of fighting between each other mm. because we don't understand each other, right? Yeah. So we are fighting. Why they are needs to change this? Uh, one one classic thing. Product people in the middle of the iteration, the sprint, etc. They want to change something, yeah, or they want to add something in the middle, something urgent. All of a sudden, yeah. But what we do, we complain mm -hmm. instead of okay, sit with me, explain why this is good. Oh, but is this urgent? No, no. Okay, I understood, understood. But explain me a little bit more, yeah, because maybe that requirement that the customer is telling to the product is not fully, uh, uh, fully ready as well. So we need to understand as engineers first why that's happening, and then, okay, it makes sense. So let's stop what we are doing. Let's do this new thing yeah. to collaborate with product. In the same like in the same way, uh, one of the, prob not problems, but learnings uh, we are having together there is that uh, we have this uh, tech versus product all the time. And uh, most of the time, product people, they have their, their, their calendar, they, they, they backlog for like three, six months, one year, mm -hmm. like planet, right? Yeah. And, uh, but... At some point, tech has a lot of things in the middle. Not the, the development process, but we have upgrades. We have new approaches we want to apply to reduce the time of development or to increase the quality, etc. And we need to start negotiating. Yeah, It will impact their backlogs. This is kind of a problem, but a good problem to solve as well. Mm -hmm. And this, this solves with communication and actually the proper communication. Just saying that is that important. Uh, it's uh, that you won't be listened. No, because everything is important. Everything is important. But as soon as you okay, this is the benefits. This is the impact. This is the risk. They start listening to you again. Yeah. So okay, they they try to understand. They they will try to understand all the time. The problem is more this communication and okay, how we can understand each other. Yeah, I think the the more we indeed focus on language, the better we can understand each other. And then it's at the end still about trust, right? If someone says no, you can still work and you can still commit and you don't have to butt heads when people disagree. Because I think always that's that's within a team of engineers and especially engineering and product, people will still disagree and people will have a different vision on how we should move or if we should move left or right, especially when it comes to product decisions. And at the end of the day, it's all assumptions anyway. Yeah. And we will have to make decisions. And then if it turns out to be wrong, exactly as if, uh, as if how you would treat engineering when when the mistake happens, you pivot. You say, okay, we've made a mistake. We've learned from that. You pivot and you go the other way. I feel like the more we realize that, that it, that it is iterations, the more flexible you'll be as a team. What I'm struggling with still is people that kind of like that or that don't like that iteration. I feel like sometimes I've worked with engineering both in teams and from outside of the team working in, people that want to do one thing and then have it be right and then not have it be changed basically. And that's really hard, I feel like, to yeah. achieve. And uh, I, I'm reading a little bit more about this this topic, uh, this product-minded engineers. Mm. That normally what we have in the teams, uh, technical-minded engineers, right? Yeah. Because we, we see the, the feature or any change, we instantly start thinking about technically how we can approach that. Yeah. But we are not thinking, okay, how the user will approach that, how the product will approach that, and then I will create the technical solution. Mm -hmm. So they are uh, uh, the, the product minded, they will, okay, why we are doing this? Yeah. For which customer? What is What are the benefits? Which way they are using? And then they start thinking about uh, the solution. This, you can see this more in the architects, for example. Mm -hmm. When you talk to an architect, the architect normally will say, okay, what the use case? what the user will do, yeah. what are the non-functional requirements, because uh, they have this full experience on this. They know how to prevent this kind of problems. Yeah. But engineers in the teams don't have this. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we have like trying to influence the, the, the engineers in the teams to think about the product first, then they can like deep dive in the technical solution. Better. No problem. Yeah, yeah. better. Yeah, I agree. 
It's funny because I'm I'm now in that product seat and I'm looking back in my experiences. And as a personal preference, I, I always went for solutions I didn't have to build because I think that would be more valuable, right? The less code we have and the more problems we solve without kind of technical solutions, that's better because that gives us room to improve and to expand in the future without kind of having this weight of code. Because I feel like more code you have, it is kind of a weight. And at some point you can do things of standardization and accommodation, but it is still weighing you down in some degrees. So the less functionality and the less features you have, I think the faster you can keep going because it, it at the end of the day, it's a marathon. But now that I'm in the product seat, I do see that, okay, even from design, when we see a problem, everyone loves coming up with solutions. Mm. We can do that, we can do that, and then that. And then people fixate on that. And I'm like, yeah, but is this, is this really a problem we should be solving? Because not every problem, I feel like, needs to have a technical <coughs> solution. No. Nope. And that's the realization, uh, yeah, that I think a lot of engineers can do well with. And uh, even like uh, I have this these kind of discussions as well because we try to follow indirectly the zero uh, bug policy mm. when we deliver something, no issue should be delivered. If mm. we find that the issue, we fix, then we deliver. Yeah. But at the end, like uh, for me, I changed my mind in this way because I was thinking all the time that no, we should deliver with zero issues. But when we start talking to the product people and say, okay, we have this issue. And we have this deadline. Yeah. And we need to deliver the software, this feature. What do you think? And they can give awesome insights. They will say, okay, this issue. Like one percent of the customers will we will hit this 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 point. Yeah. So let's deliver because of the time or restrictions and any other thing, constraints, and then we can fix it. So this kind of prioritization is good as well. Because yeah. it's like as a quality engineer, we don't want to see anything being delivered with uh, uh, bugs or, or failures. Yeah. But like as soon as we start talking to product people, they have all the insights. Norm they can even see like a small issue that is not blocking issue, but okay, this is important. No, and we need to fix that. Yeah. So from from my perspective, I was like looking, oh, but this is a, this is not like stopping anything, but this is an issue. But maybe for the product people, no, this is a huge issue. This is differently because I have this, this, and that insight. Yeah. So it's it, it's good also to have this kind of. Uh, it's not good that we de that we think and we deliver software with issues, but it's good to have the conversation with product people to understand uh, what is the impact. Yeah. Right. Yeah, of course. Emergency. Of course. When you have something blocking that you know that will block the, the operation and the customer will stop, of course, we'll fix right away. But other things, just talk to product people. And uh, it's hard when we say, okay, we are delivering things with bugs. It's it's really hard. We don't yeah. want this because the whole uh, the whole like the the whole area, the whole IT area is telling you all the time we need to deliver without any issues. Yes, like a professional pride. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as soon as we start learning a little bit more about it, talking more with the product people to understand this, it's it's become easier actually to deliver software, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's funny because you really made me reflect on kind of the gaming industry. When I'm thinking back, when I had like a PS1, I would have this disc, <laughs> and then that would be that, and all the bugs that would be on that video game, I, I, it would be there forever. Yeah. yeah, forever basically. And nowadays, you download your software. You don't even have like a disc anymore or a, or a SD card or anything. It comes, and as soon as it hits release it already comes with an update patch. And then probably the next day, another update patch because somehow with a certain button combination, you can clip through a wall and then you're out of bounds. And then, oh, they fix that with another patch. And things get released with more bugs. And I especially see it in the gaming industry, mm -hmm. sometimes with too many bugs, but then immediately they hit you with upgrade patches where all of a sudden it looks like a really good game again. Yeah. yeah. A and it's tricky because when I play as well, sometimes I'm playing, uh, playing something and I'm not, I'm not seeing that issues. Yeah. And some players are. Absolutely. So it's exactly like this, like the, uh, I'm trying to try to combine with the, what I'm saying about product. So maybe the product will say, okay, this issue, only 10% of the players will, will reach this point. So yeah. let's deliver and then we patch. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. most of the users, most of the players won't, won't reach that point. So it's fine for now. Yeah. So we need to have this balance as well, right? Of course, we don't like it when, uh, as soon as we see it, right? As the players, let's say. Yeah. But yeah, it's the, is the time to market we it's know the reality. everything yeah. yeah i think the the hard part or like the downside would be because people also estimate then their releases on that 
Let's say if we're still mm -hmm. taking the video game example, oh, we did that in the past, then yeah, we can still make these deadlines because everything looks the similar. Same, yeah. The problem is the reality is not always similar. So then all of a sudden you might have to release or you might have a deadline, which is actually not feasible anymore. And then you can do two things, I think I've seen from engineering position. You can really do everything in your power, work day and night and try and make it happen. And then you still have that kind of make or break moment or you have to push back and say, listen, um, I can't do it. If you want, go ahead, even though they, they cannot do it because they're not technical mm -hmm. minded, but you have to have that conversation. And those conversations are, can be quite hard. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I, exactly as you said, when you're asking for help, you did your homework, right? You said, why? You said, this is the urgency. If we don't do this, then these are the consequences. That really helps when driving those conversations. But at the end of the day, I feel like with mature software development, with mature engineers, a skill is also putting your foot down and saying no sometimes. Yeah, yeah. That for, that's for sure. And uh, we have a lot of ways to do it, like even during the interaction, let's say uh, if you do, uh, if you use like uh, sprints, for example, if you use Scrum, we know that from Scrum that, okay, you can add a, as much as features as possible during the, the this time frame, like can be one week, two weeks, etc. Yeah. But we know that we can prioritize one or two. Mm -hmm. And the PO can say, those are the real priorities from this inter iteration. Yeah. So let's focus on this first. If we focus on that first and we see problems, the PO knows that other features are not that important than that one. Yeah. So we can we can have even ways to try to uh, avoid some, most of the problems of it, but it's still it's there. So the, the communication part, mm -hmm. right? So uh, this, this, this must happen with the product. And th this is also communication problems, right? Because uh, we have the deadlines, we have issues, and sometimes we don't know how to express when we are having issues and we see, okay, this product or this interaction for this feature cannot be delivered or won't be delivered on time. We don't know how to express the problem to the product people and say, okay, those are the implications, those yeah. are the risks, those are the problems. So in the end, actually, basically, almost everything is communication, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And I think the hard part is, and maybe this is a cop out, a lot of communication skills, a lot of that kind of business language, that way of working comes with experience, right? You have to have been in a team where there's a mature level of software development and delivery and milestones that get hit time and time after again, that you see, oh, there's a dialogue that's happening and we're not just executing. I feel like if you find yourself in a team that's just executing mm -hmm. and that is bumping heads, and then that's a symptom of a dialogue that's not happening and it, it needs to happen for things to progress, I feel yeah. like. Yeah. I really enjoyed this, man. This was a blast. Cool. Yeah, was this kind of what you expected coming into this? Yes. Yeah. It was, it was yes, yes, because like this conversation is like going to different directions. Yeah. It's good because, yeah, we can talk about basically everything, right? Awesome. Cool. Then I'm going to round it off here. If you're still listening, let us know in the comment section what you thought about this episode. And with that being said, thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next one.